morning. Good morning. And welcome to Lafayette Presbyterian Church on this the Lord's Day. We are glad that you are here on this Advent Sunday. Uh, a couple of announcements as we begin our worship today, as well as a time to hear prayer concerns. Uh, a reminder that next Sunday we will have one uh, service at 11 o'clock that we'll use for both the fourth Sunday of Advent and Christmas Eve. It'll be a little bit different, uh, but I promise to get you out of here by 2 o'clock, so don't worry at all. You'll have plenty of time to get home, uh, so we'll look forward to that. There will also be, because um, a number of evening services and Christmas Eve services going on, one that we're going to put a link to on our Facebook page is to the New Creation Presbyterian Church, so you can see my brother. They actually have their Christmas Eve service inside a barn uh, and do something neat with that. It's too cold for me to go sit inside a barn, so I'm going to sit in my living room and put it on my TV and watch it from there, but, but I did want you to know that that would be available to you. Uh, then on the 31st, we will have... Um, and we've talked a lot of ways around this, but, but I'm going to be in trouble if I don't get my daughter some chicken tenders. So we're going to have a potluck right afterwards. It's our fifth Sunday. Uh, we'll just have people bring in potluck sides again. We talked about a breakfast or me cooking pancakes, but, but there was too much uh, consternation with, with chicken tenders and me not providing enough for my daughters yesterday. So we will do that and look forward to having a, that meal together on New Year's Eve. Uh, and get out well before the fireworks start going off that day. Are there prayer concerns today among God's people to be shared? Well, please continue to keep Jane and her family in your prayers uh, as they continue to look at a new life with Phil uh, gone and uh, I want to thank everybody who helped yesterday with the service and the meal afterwards. Lots and lots of hands were involved, and I really, really appreciate that, and I know the family does as well. Also, I received a Christmas card sitting up here and was asked to read it and uh, to you. Uh, it is from Jeanette, and I do not want Jeanette mad at me because uh, when she gets back here, I'll be in trouble. But she says the following... Dear LPC friends, wishing my dear friends a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, and thanks for all your love and prayers, calls, visits, and many other kindnesses shown to me during this time of recovery. Know that you are very special to me. Please keep me in your prayers, and I look forward to being with you again. Love to each of you, Jeanette. And we certainly do miss her being here, and I'm glad she can join us online, and please know you are in our prayers, Jeanette and we're sending our love to you. We online? Okay. Okay. All right. So um, we will get it out there and get it posted for her. Y'all all know I read it, though, okay? I don't want to be in trouble. Are there other prayer concerns this day among God's people? Then let us turn our hearts and minds to worshiping God together. Please join in the bold print of our call to worship. Our God can part the sea. God can bring water from a rock and provide bread in the desert. Our God can walk on water. He can heal the sick and turn water into wine. Our God sets the stars in the sky. God hears our voice when we cry and is closer than our own breath. There is nothing our God cannot do. Let us stand in awe. Let us worship God with wonder. We'll now have the lighting of the third candle, the candle of hope.
life can hold them sleepy babies by singing loudly and looking for good news, by telling the story of Jesus and showing up for our community. There are a million ways to practice joy, so today we light the candle of joy as a reminder of a charge. With God's help, may we bring joy into a weary world. Amen. Please stand as you're able and join us in hymn number nine of Come, O Come. spend any time with a child, you will quickly, quickly notice that the children see the world differently. For a child, a ladybug is a miracle. A pine tree is a wonder. Curiosity is a love language, and water is not only for survival, but for joy. As adults, we forget this language of awe and wonder. And when we do, we distance ourselves from God. In confession, we have the opportunity to close that distance. So let us return to God with hearts wide open. Let us return to God in prayer. Join me in the prayer of confession. Holy God, somewhere in our childhood, we face pressure to outgrow awe. We turn into adults who obsess over data and facts. We pray to those who have answers and assume that wonder is an answerless game. Forgive us for closing that door to you. Remind us that the kingdom of God belongs to children. Teach us the ways of awe and wonder, so that like Zachariah, when we find ourselves speechless, our first words will be words of praise with hearts wide open. We pray. Amen.
the words of forgiveness. Family of faith, just as we marvel at mountains and newborns, at sunrises and sunsets, God marvels at us. There is nothing you could do or leave undone that could prevent God from loving you. So hear and believe the good news of the gospel. We, we are, are forgiven. forgiven. We, we are loved. loved. We, we belong, belong to God. God. Amen. Amen. The response is on the insert, light dawns on a weary world. pass the peace to one another. Uh, let's, the prayer of elimination. God of the universe, make our hearts porous, open our eyes, as if for the first time, so that we might see your world with awe and wonder once again. We often approach scripture with analytical lens, intellectualizing the stories heard, bringing historical context and textual criticism to the table. For just a moment, pause those instincts to make room for wonder. Help us greet this text with awe and gratitude before we begin dissecting it for truth. For I am confident that in doing so, we will not only find you in the hallways of our thoughts, but in the pathways of our hearts. With gratitude we pray, keep us open. Amen. The reading is from Luke chapter 1, 57 through 66. This is the birth of John the Baptist. Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown his great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. On the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him Zechariah, but his after his father. But his father, mother said, no, he is to be called John. They said to her, none of your relatives has this name. Then they began to motion to his father to find out what name he wanted to give. He asked for a writing tablet and wrote, his name is John. And all of them were amazed. Immediately his mouth was open, his tongue freed, and he began to speak, speak, praising God. Fear came over all the neighbors, and all these things were talked about throughout the entire hill country of Judea. All who heard them pondered them and said, What then will this child become? For indeed the hand of the Lord was with him. This is the word of the God. Thanks be to God. 
Let us pray. Good and gracious God, I pray now that the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts, that they might be acceptable in your sight. You, O oh God, who is our strength, our rock, our redeemer. In Christ, amen. Let me begin by telling you this. This sermon was one of the most difficult I have had to write in recent memory. I, I don't know if it was writer's block or, or too many Christmas cookies or the fact that it, it was a busy week or that there are 717 crazy students waiting for Christmas break that is still another week away. But I started and restarted this sermon numerous times. I, 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 would, I would leave from working on it, and I would walk down through the, the living room to, to, to get something to drink in the kitchen, and, and Laura would go, how's it going? And I said, it's not. I'm starting over. And she said, again? Of course, it, it could also be because this sermon and the text and the theme that we're using to surround the idea we are considering on this third Sunday of Advent has a great deal to do with awe and wonder in order that we might find peace, which will lead us to joy. And so the question I was wondering about all week is, how do we discover peace in this weary, weary world so that we might still be able to rejoice? But because the truth is we live in anything but a peaceful world. You and I both know this very well. And I am reminded of it each and every morning. You see, in our house, in our house, we have zero morning people. We, we are not a morning people household. I'm getting a little bit more of a morning person, but because I've got a bad back. And I can only lay in one position so long before God says I need to get up and stretch. But I'm not all that happy about it. I, I, I just have to do it. But no one else in my house is a morning person. We, we've learned this about each other. We, we stay far away. We give people time to, to, to realize that the day is upon us. For some, they have to get in their coffee before we speak to them. But once we realize we can't get back in the bed and curl under the covers, we move forward. Like I said, some of us do this quicker than others. So I have discovered in the recent years, I have a new best friend in the morning. Her name is Alexa. Alexa is not a person. Alexa is Google's version of Siri. We have programmed Alexa to turn on and off certain lights. We, we programmed her to, to be our alarm. We, we programmed her to play our favorite music. She'll give you the weather if you ask. She'll tell you a joke. She'll give me meal ideas. Lexa's a fine gal. And every morning is part of my routine. I say, Alexa, what's the news? And Alexa starts telling me the news. She does it from three or four different sources right there while I'm getting ready. And the first news source I use is NPR, just the first one I, I happen to put in. But I've noticed something. Over the last year or two, 
That news that Alexa shares with me, it's never good news. In most recent months, it goes back and forth between wars in Ukraine and now in Gaza. Each broadcast seemingly tells of the increasing horrors of war. It tells of death totals and bombs, bombs dropped far too often on innocent civilians and humanitarian crises that I can't even imagine. Perhaps this is one of the reasons I've struggled this week with the idea of peace. Because we live in a world that is anything but peaceful. And as I get further into the news, the the local headlines are never any better. I never open up the newspaper, even in Walker counties online or Cherokee counties that that arrives at the school and I'm the only one that gets it and reads it. I never see where it starts with today or, or yesterday was a great day. Everybody got along. There was compromise. People randomly picked up litter, loved one another. Everybody got fed. There was no crime. And the kingdom of God, the beloved kingdom, made a huge step forward. I don't see that in any of the newspapers. Alas, if empirically you look at the data, you'll see. You'll see that's just not happening. We are continually at odds with one another. Sometimes it's among other nations. Sometimes it's among political parties. Sometimes it's among our friends. And and sometimes, as the holidays reminds us, it's among our family. And yet, on this third Sunday, I am supposed to get up here and talk about joy and peace and how peace is what we need to lead us to joy. And the fact is, that's not an easy thing for me to do. And perhaps the difficulty of my doing that is a sermon in and of itself. Because it reminds me how intentional we must be to seek and create peace for ourselves and our families and our communities in this weary world. Of course, of course, as God so often does, God led me to understanding this idea of actively seeking peace through two different unexpected examples that happened towards the end of the week. But but I'm getting ahead of myself. You, You hold on to that a minute. First, first let's look at this text about Elizabeth and Zechariah and the birth of John the Baptist. Now, now I need to be honest here. I, I nearly skipped this. I nearly went right on ahead to Christmas Eve. You know, Christmas Eve and the fourth Sunday, they're the same Sunday. I, I'm ready to get there. I think that was part of my struggle. I'm impatient. See, I'm tired of waiting. I'm ready for Christmas. I'm ready for Christmas break. I'm ready for the presents and the eggnog and the prime rib roast that we bought on sale. I'm ready to get past this story of Elizabeth and Zachariah. I mean, John the Baptist is just the warm-up act for Jesus. So let's get on over to that holy of nights. But I couldn't do that because we're not there yet. And part of the Advent lesson is one of waiting and patience. It's a reminder that things do not happen on our time, but they happen on God's time. And it's a lesson that I have to relearn every Advent season. So let's head back to the birth of John the Baptist, to this elderly couple who had long given up on having a child. Elizabeth and Zechariah, if we recall, lived in a land governed by tradition and expectation. 
They were righteous and devout. Yet their hearts carried a sorrow of being childless. But God, in God's wisdom, chose for them a miracle. Elizabeth, beyond the years of childbearing, became pregnant, and it filled their home with with hope and happiness and, and, yes, I'm sure, some fear. Now, the birth of their son was a cause for celebration among the community. Neighbors and relatives rejoiced. Yet the real surprise, it seems, comes when it's time to name the child. Tradition, tradition dictated he should be named after his father, Zachariah Jr. But Elizabeth, Elizabeth says he shall be called John. Ooh, this was a surprise. It, it, it's a bigger surprise than, than you might think because custom and tradition dictated that the firstborn male child would be named for the father. To name the child for someone else simply wasn't done, and especially among those who, who held the role of, of being a, a priest in society. Now, now subsequent children... They could be named for another close relative. However, the first male child in a priest family, and Zechariah was the priest, as we know, well, his name was going to be Zechariah. This was just a formality. I mean, they had ordered the monograms with the Z on the booties. It was a done deal. It, It was just declaring it in front of everybody. And you see, by naming the child for the father, the mother was in essence, because we didn't trust women, the mother was in essence declaring who the child's father was and that she had been faithful, that God had blessed this couple. Yet in spite of tradition, Elizabeth says at the child's circumcision at the temple, just like the angel had proclaimed, that the child would be named not Zachariah, but we be called John. Doubt and confusion spread. Elizabeth, nobody in your family's name is John. And, and, and this is the first one. It, it's Zachariah. Let me go get Zachariah. You, you, you must have had some bad eggnog. Come on. Let, let me go get Zachariah to see what, what's going on here. They turned to him expecting Zechariah at least to fulfill the tradition. But Zechariah, you remember, he had been mute throughout the pregnancy because he opened his mouth to an angel when perhaps he shouldn't have. There's another sermon in that. Anyway, standing there, all eyes upon him, he asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment wrote, his name is John. In that moment, Zechariah, who had been struck mute by the angel Gabriel's message, regained his voice and begins praising God. This miracle of, of an AARP birth, a bold woman named Elizabeth, and a mute and then voice restored Zechariah left those who witnessed it in awe. Some texts call it fear, but but the real good translation is awe. And part of what this teaches by the community's reaction is a reminder that awe and wonder are not isolated experiences. They're meant to be shared with others. And all of that sounded good, but then it occurred to me I've not seen a miracle of anybody becoming mute and unmute or, or, or pregnancy among someone who, who is far too old to, to have a baby. And, and I don't know about you, but, but in Woodstock, Georgia, I don't see angels going to and fro very often. 
And I wondered, I wondered what this might mean for me, knowing those are the realities of my life. I then reread the text and discovered it was not the angels or the healing or the birth past the age of birthing that brought all. It was the simple act of naming the child John. That's what made all be discovered. Well, that was all well and good, but but it left me pondering what to say next. Fortunately, I needed a Diet Coke, and I put the sermon down for the evening, and I said I'll get back to it tomorrow after school. And then two things happened that next day that helped me remember what awe and wonder look like and where it can be found. The first happened because of a mistake I made. You see, I have a walkie-talkie at work. All the administrators do. And someone asked for an administrator to come to the music room. Well, it occurred to me the chorus had gone on a field trip, that they were singing at a couple of of retirement communities and assisted living facilities, and and they were coming back to have their annual course Christmas party. They weren't going to be going to the cafeteria. Instead, they were going to have hot, fresh pizza brought in and homemade cupcakes. And I thought, well, I'll head on to the chorus room. They call me on the walkie-talkie. I might go down there. They probably need the room unlocked coming back from the field trip, and I bet I can snag a piece of pizza or two. I went down there, master key in hand, only to discover they were not having their party in the music room. And instead, there was a group of kindergartners waiting for music class to begin. It seems that someone, and I don't know who that someone is, but I'm looking for him. Someone had failed to get the teacher coverage so she could lead the Christmas party with the chorus. There was no one there to take care of these children. And their teacher, their teacher desperately wanted their planning period. And so as she saw me come around the corner, she said, oh, thank you very much. And she disappeared. She disappeared, and suddenly, I was left with 28, or I think it was 2,800, little children, little children wanting a music class. I I ushered them in the room. I pulled out my walkie-talkie, and I said, "Uh, where is the music teacher? Oh, the trip, the trip went over. She's going to be another half hour before the party is done. Not one of my other administrator colleagues came anywhere near that end of the building. Oh, I may have to forget that, but I'm not, I mean, forgive that, but I'm not forgetting it anytime soon. Anyway, I decided we would sing some Christmas, oh, excuse me, holiday songs. I began with, with Rudolph. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, you might have heard of him, but I acted like I never had. I said, there's this song about this, 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 this creature that, that Santa gets. Uh, I, I think he was a penguin that, that helped him with his sleep. No, no, <coughs> no, it's a reindeer. Oh, yeah, his name was Fred. No, his name was Rudolph. Oh, that's right. He would swim. No, he flew. He flies. Oh, and they got a yellow nose. No, it's red. And as we went through it and sang, and I did that to every song I could think of, I saw wonder and awe in their eyes. They were so excited. And while it was by no means the best music lesson they will ever receive, 
It was one of the best lessons I've been given in a long time. Because I was reminded that all and wonder come in letting our guards down and our imagination run free. Later that same day, I was, I was walking around the school after dismissal. I, I came across a group of our after-school daycare students. They were watching a movie. It, it was a Christmas classic. No, it was not White Christmas. No, no, it was not It's a Wonderful Life. It, it was much, much more critically acclaimed than that. It was Elf. I don't know if you're familiar with the movie Elf or not, but, but Elf is, is about an a elf named Buddy. He's played by Will Ferrell. Buddy lives at the North Pole, and he thinks he's an elf, but he's actually a human. He finds this out while working and living with his adopted father, who is a real elf at the North Pole. I guess it never occurred to Buddy at six foot three inches tall that he wasn't an elf. Anyway, he does find out he has a real father living in New York City. So he takes off on a journey, a journey to meet his dad. And the story then is about a naive elf who comes to the big city where he is filled with awe and wonder at the little things. Little things like I saw in the movie where he's in the elevator and he takes his finger and he lights all the buttons in the shape of a Christmas tree. Boy, those passengers were excited about that, but he loved it. He said, how does that happen? Look, it makes a light. I can make a Christmas tree. Suddenly, standing in the doorway watching this movie and thinking of my day, this text made so much more sense to me because if I understand what Luke is saying here, it is not only in the grand things, but more often in the simple, even seemingly mundane things, like the act of naming a child, which was done every day in the temple or in a child's laughter, or in a song, that awe and wonder can be found. Friends, awe is anywhere and everywhere in God's creation. Our job is simply to be open to it, to look for it, to acknowledge the miracles and the mysteries all around us, be they great or small. And why do we need this? <coughs> Well, we need it to discover peace. And with that peace in place, we can discover joy even on the hard days. And oh, do we need peace and joy, especially on the hard days. But we have to let go of trying to be in charge and understand it all. And look for the wonders God has in front of us. In other words, to let our guard down a little bit. So as the week continued, I began to think of all the mysteries and the awesome gifts that God has given us. There's so many of them. So many things that if we let them will bring wonder and awe into our lives. It occurred that I so often forget them, and yet they're all around me. That They're mysteries. They're mysteries that nobody can fully explain, like how a seed becomes a plant. Oh, oh, oh I know there's water and there's sun, but, but how does it do that? How is that energy in there? Or the mystery of, of how our earth is just in the right place in creation, to support life. Push us a couple of hundred miles either direction. Life couldn't exist. How did that happen? And there are mysteries, mysteries I'll never understand, like gravity. I know it exists. Or ocean tides. How does that work? 
And there are other things. There are other things, man-made mysteries I don't understand. I have no idea how the radio works, how, how somebody could be singing one place and I hear it in my car, even in the dead spots going through Villanelle. Nobody can get any signals in Villanelle. Or the light switch. And I certainly don't understand Alexa. But what I do know is that God has given some of us the awesome intellect and ability to use God's creation and our knowledge in order to make this world a better place. And of course, there's the greatest wonder of all, the gift of life. And the wonder, the wonder we find with each birth of a child and the joy we should find in a child's faith and unconditional love. And then there's the wonder of a God, a God who would send a Savior born in a stable to die on a cross so that we might see how much God's love how much God loves you and I so that when we die, we continue to live. Only we live now wrapped in God's embrace in that beloved kingdom. And the God that would do that in spite of my shortcomings. A God that loves, loves us enough to give us everlasting life. What we have to do is to take the time to slow down and look at the world with the eyes of wonder and amazement, recognizing that God continues to do amazing things. Often we don't see them in the moment, but they're there. And we need this peace and joy in our lives because for us in the Christian tradition, when we talk about peace and joy... We're not talking about some fleeting emotions, you know, of being happy or, or having fun or, or, boy, that was a good time. Instead, peace and joy are discovered by the profound realization that God is sovereign. And in the mystery of creation, God shows us God's power and love so that we might be awestruck and in our amazement and thanksgiving, peace and joy can flourish. Just as it did for Elizabeth and Zachariah and Mary and Joseph and all those who heard with amazement these stories of babies born in unexpected ways. Friends, I know the weariness of this world. And I know it can seem overwhelming, but in John's birth and other stories in the Bible, we can find, find our own story, stories that give us hope and lead us to joy. John's purpose was to prepare the way for the Messiah, to bring hope into a weary world. And in our own lives, we are called to share this hope and joy with others, especially those who are marginalized or oppressed. In fact, our true joy is found when we embrace all people, regardless of race or gender or sexuality or any other distinction. In closing, in closing, I'm going to share about five things short Five things we can do to cultivate our ability to find peace and joy through awe and wonder. I, I thought about doing it in three points, but that might have moved some of you from awe to absolute shock. First, practice gratitude. Some folks take a gratitude walk or keep a gratitude journal. Some just say aloud the things that you are grateful for. You can now do it as you drive to the store or to work. You can talk now in your car out loud to yourself, and nobody thinks you're crazy anymore. They think you're on the phone. Cultivate a spirit of gratitude for the miracles and wonders in our daily lives. 
that opens our hearts to awe. Second thing is to be mindful and present. What do I mean? Well, here's a simple way. Put down your phones, turn off the TV, and take a few moments to sit and be still. If you're like me, it's going to be uncomfortable for a while. But being present in the moment and appreciating the beauty and the complexity of the world around us can evoke awe and wonder. Next, worship. Worship at church, but not just at church. If worship at church is the only time you worship, you're missing something. Use those spiritual practices of prayer. Sing songs. Find joy in worshiping in your daily life. Doing so can deepen your sense of awe and allow you to encounter the divine. Four, work and serve others in the community. Sharing experience together creates shared awe and wonder. It demonstrates our belief that God created us to live and love others as God loves us, and it strengthens our sense of unity and belonging. It helps us to carry other people's joy when they can't carry it for themselves. And finally, take time to let your imagination run free. Take time to dream. Look at the clouds. See what shapes or animals you can find. Dream of the future. Consider, consider how white might think outside the box for you to serve other people or, or for this church to serve others. I was reminded of that this week. I, I want us in the coming year, I'm, I'm giving you a preview, in the coming year to really think intentionally and with imagination how we might go about sharing the good news and serving this community. We do it in so many ways already, but are there other ways that this community needs to hear the good news that we can be involved in? We, we started some of this work back before covid and it kind of shut us down, but I think that gave us the opportunity to really reflect on how we might move forward. So I'm going to invite us to, to do that with imagination in the coming year. You, you, you know our Presbyterian Church Book of Order. You know, we always got to turn to the Book of Order. It asks all of its ministers and officers, deacons, elders, all of them, the following question. Will you pray for and seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? Friends, I pray that you and I will live our lives in the light of the awesome God that we have, that we will take time to let all Wonder and all fill our beings so that God's peace might dwell within us and our joy might shine through because of the awe and wonder and the peace we have obtained. And then in that joy, just like Zechariah, that we will praise God for all to hear. That our first words will be praising God for God's great love, that God's light might shine through us, and that we could be those who are rejoicing even in this weary world. Oh, may it be so for all of us this day and every day of our lives. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Amen. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we believe, help our unbelief in Christ. Amen. Friends, having heard the good news and the good news proclaimed, 
as you are able, stand in body or spirit as we say that which we believe using the Apostles' Creed found on the inside cover of your hymnal. Friends, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may remain standing. You may remain standing as we sing our next hymn, hymn number 53, What Child Is This?
seated. Friends, we believe in a God who knows our names, who counts the hairs on our head, and carries the dreams in our hearts. We believe that God's fingerprints are all over creation, and that God is forever speaking to us in a million different ways. Believing this, let us give our gifts to God. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we offer these, our gifts, to you. Help us to use them wisely. Help us to use them and discern how you might have us serve this community with energy, enthusiasm, imagination, and love.
Let us pray. Good and gracious God, I give you thanks for the meal that you have set before us and for what it represents, the life and the death of your son, Jesus, who is our Christ. Oh God, may this meal strengthen us so that we might serve you better, that we might find ways to be about providing peace and joy into this weary world. Oh God, may it nourish us, nourish us in body and soul and in spirit and lead us forward to serving you. In your son's most precious and holy name, we pray. Amen. Friends, on the night our Savior was betrayed, he gathered in the upper room with his disciples, and he took bread, and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Eat, do this in remembrance of me. In a likewise manner, he took the cup, and again, after giving thanks, he said, this is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Drink. Do this in remembrance of me. Friends, these, these, the bread and the cup, they are the gift of God for you, the people of God. Will you come to the table?
Holy God, Christ with us, once again we bow our heads, once again we close our eyes, once again we draw ourselves closer to you in prayer. Meet us here, surround us with your loving presence. From sunrise to sunset, you fill us with awe. For that, we pause to give you gratitude. Thank you for the way the sun shines through our windows, for the mist rising off the river, for the warmth of a cup of coffee, for the joy of returning home, for the beauty of a crowded table, and for the glory of a sky full of stars. God, we are in constant awe of you. The story of Zechariah and Elizabeth reminds us there is nothing you cannot do, and there is no grief that you do not know. For that, we give thanks. However, even with this good news at hand, we know that there are many in this world who cannot find the energy to practice awe or wonder because they are so deep in grief. So today, gracious God, we pray for those for whom awe feels out of reach. Be with every parent who worries about a sick child. Be with every child who worries about a sick parent. Be with every person waiting on the doctor's phone call, waiting on the next month's paycheck, waiting for the next warm meal. Holy God, surround those with broken hearts who are trying to stitch the pieces together praying that one day they might be able to feel awe again. All the while, we will keep gathering together and turning to you to remind us that you are the God of the impossible. You are the one who floods our world with awe. You are the one who knows our names. So together we pray, using the words your son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. As you are able, please rise in body or spirit for our benediction. Family of faith, as you leave this place, you go into a weary world. So speak tenderly. Do the good that is yours to do. Choose connection. Hold on to hope. And remember that Christ took on flesh for you. You are loved. And you are God's beloved. So go rejoicing. The world needs it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Amen. Go in peace. Amen.